Bad Choices Dear Dr. Tracy, I am a 33-year-old divorced woman with four kids. I was married for 12 years and have been divorced for approximately three years. I met my new boyfriend during my divorce. We hit it off and have been together ever since. He is a 44-year-old divorced man. When I met him, he had been divorced for two years. Well, I met his ex-wife, and she seemed to be an okay person. What I found out three months into my relationship with him was that he was fooling around with his ex-wife again, who also at this time had a boyfriend of her own. I figured that since I did not have a committed relationship with him, I had no place to say anything. The problem is, it continued further into our relationship, up to the point when I found out I was pregnant. At the same time, I found out that he and his ex-wife planned to go to his family reunion together. Of course, before all of this, I drove by his house one night and saw her car parked outside his home. The excuse I got after all of this was that they were considering getting back together. I thought it was very funny that as soon as she met me, she found interest in him again. I guess my issue is the fact that I'm now still in this relationship. I have brought a child into this nonsense, and I hate the fact that he keeps in contact with her. My boyfriend has taken responsibility for her son from a previous relationship. His excuse for having so much contact with his ex-wife is because of that boy. I know this is not true, but I have no real proof otherwise. I have also dealt with him taking women to hotels, and my gut tells me it was her but he promises it was not her. I have tried to get over all the cheating. I know that she is very close to his family, and I also know that his family does not like me because I stand up for myself. I guess the bottom line is knowing how much contact his ex-wife has with him and the fact that he knows that I can't stand her. Am I in a weird relationship with a man that wants to have his cake and eat it too? Or am I being paranoid and need to just trust him when he says he does not want her. I have never had so much animosity towards two people in my life. I do love this man, but I feel like I have put myself back in an unhealthy relationship with a man that is trying to lie to me. To be totally honest, now that I have his child, I even hate the fact that he helps her son. She never has to ask for anything regarding that boy, but I have to constantly remind him when our son needs something. He does it for the other boy without thinking, but my son is a second thought. Even when I have said, look at your son, he is in dire need. I was married to a cheating man and hooked up with another cheating man. I wonder if it's just my bad choices in men. Double Standard Family is uneasy when one sister dates other's ex-lover. Dear Abby, my sister Jane and I are both in our mid-fifties. Jane has had numerous affairs over the past several years after her third divorce and was involved in an intimate relationship with a terrific man, Will, that lasted about three months. Jane broke up with Will several months after she decided he wasn't what she was looking for. And she's presently engaged to be married to a very nice man, Sam, and seems very happy. I dated Will several times before he and Jane became involved. We weren't intimate at that time, and we started seeing each other again over the last month. This time we have fallen in love. My problem is Jane is upset that Will and I are together and says I have betrayed her. She is worried about having her former and current lovers present at family gatherings, and our parents are also concerned. They say it's just weird. The fact that my sister was intimate with Will doesn't bother me or Will, but it sure bothers them. Abby, I have always been the good girl in the family and bowed to their pressure. But my relationship with Will is more than I could have ever imagined, 
and I don't want to give up my future happiness just to make my sister and my parents more comfortable. My adult children have all met and approve of Will in our relationship, but Jane and my parents won't budge. Any suggestions? Signed, Once Will in Walla Walla, Washington. Dear Once Will, Perhaps it's time to stop being the good girl. Begin acting like a woman who knows what she wants and confront the double standard in your family. If your sister was sophisticated enough to have serial affairs and your parents have been so worldly that they have turned a blind eye to it, then you should all be adult enough to realize that you are entitled to your happiness too. Although this may make for some awkward first few family gatherings, as grown-ups, everyone should be able to get past it. But if they can't, you are going to have to decide whether you want this man or to be a people pleaser for the rest of your life. Greek family. Woman will never be Greek enough for husband's family. Dear Abby, I married a Greek man whose family never accepted me. Being young and naive, I tried everything to fit in, converting from Catholicism to the Greek Orthodox faith, attending all family functions, including them in our lives. It was never enough. My husband and I traveled to Crete with his family to visit his relatives there, and some extended family members refused to share the dinner table with me because I was not Greek. One of those family members was a priest. Our daughter, Athena, was born four years later. What broke the camel's back for me was a Christmas dinner when she was six. My father-in-law gave cards with $100 to all the ground children of Greek heritage. Athena received nothing and cried for hours, wanting to know why her grandfather didn't love her. My husband just tried to stay neutral. Abby, how far should someone have to go to fit in with their husband's family? Signed, Irish again in New Hampshire. Long Time Affair Long Time Affair appears set to last for long time to come. Dear Abby, I'm married. He's married. We're in love and have been for eight years. We've tried breaking it off several times over the years, but a force bigger than both of us keeps bringing us back together. I never believed in soulmates or true love until we met. Our love is deep and unconditional. Our roots are intertwined. It's a shame that it happened late in life, but it happened nonetheless. He always treats me like a queen. Neither of us is leaving our spouses or family. We are both in our 50s and sometimes act like we're in our 20s. It's magical. Is it wrong? Do we go on until something changes? Do we try for the hundredth time to break away? An affair, no matter how you slice it, will never be accepted in the eyes of traditional society. So it will be perceived as unacceptable. What's your opinion? Signed, Bewitched, Bothered, and Bewildered in New York. Young mother is frightened by threat of lost custody. Dear Abby, I am 22 years old and have been married 17 months. Derek and I have a 23-month-old son. Derek hasn't worked for about a year and refuses to help support our family. He also belittles me whenever he talks to me. I am not happy in this marriage, but I am not sure what to do about it. On our honeymoon, Derek told me if I ever divorced him that he'd make sure he would get custody of our son. And his mom already said that she would tell the judge that I was an unfit mother. My son is my world, Abby. He doesn't even let his daddy hold him, so I know he wouldn't be better off with Derek. But because I am on disability, I don't know if I have a good chance of getting custody if I leave. I don't feel Derek loves me or my son. What should I do? Stick it out with my husband or take the chance of losing my son? Signed, Trapped in New Hampshire.
wife ready to wash her hands of meddling mother-in-law. Dear Abby, how do I politely tell my mother-in-law to stop doing my laundry? It all started when I was on bed rest due to my pregnancy. I didn't mind her doing an occasional load to help us out, but now she does it any time she's over to watch the kids. I'm very picky about how I do my laundry, and this is the main reason I don't want her doing it. Also, I prefer she spend time playing with the kids than with the laundry. She also puts things away in the wrong places. She does it with my dishes too. Once I told her not to worry about my laundry because I wasn't done sorting it. She took it upon herself to do it anyway. She's very strong-willed. My husband and I have had problems with her not respecting our parenting too. She often takes things the wrong way. What's the best way for us to tell her that her help is not needed? Dirty family laundry. Neighbors get an eyeful when nudist steps outside. Dear Abby, we have a male neighbor I'll call Flash who frequently walks out to get his newspaper or the mail or to retrieve something from his car while he's as naked as the day he was born. He's in his late 50s and divorced. Some of the women in the neighborhood know not to look towards Flash's home if they're out for a walk. They have discovered that he is most likely in the buff, standing at his glass door or sitting at his front office computer with the door open. Flash is otherwise a likable and helpful neighbor. We hesitate to say anything. We do not want to say anything that might destroy that relationship. It's not against the law to be a nudist or for a woman to go topless in public in this city. However, to see a fella streak to his car is a little surprising and unsettling, even for another adult. In the normal course of things, he may be spotted in the nude once a week. I can only assume this goes on daily, but thankfully, our paths don't cross more than once a week. Is this something we should be concerned about? Startled in Austin, Texas. Parents deny probable cause of son's obsessive behavior. Dear Abby, my nephew, Vincent, is 16 and has had problems with obsessive hand washing for years. I have enough professional experience to strongly suspect that he suffers from obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD. My brother and his wife refuse to believe their child has a problem and will not take him to get help. My nephew's hands are chafed and raw and his parents reprimand him for this behavior when he really needs professional help. His mother is the biggest problem. She nixes all issues that suggest a problem and my brother will not stand up to her. What can I do? Signed, Worried Aunt in Florida. Our Universal Journey. A cat with an incurable kind of cancer. A job that is always tenuous. Human relationships that are fragile, unpredictable, and sometimes tumultuous. My own body, seemingly healthy, but still subject to disease, fatigue, and aging. Life is unpredictable. However much we think we have a handle on it, the truth is we never really know what's to come. Everything can change in an instant. This is a tough truth to accept, for though we know intellectually that all things in life are impermanent, we often don't feel it instinctively. We persist in our attempts to control life. We imagine that we can predict and manipulate future events. We imagine that we control, or at least have a strong influence on, external events. But this is not really the case. In fact, all that worry, manipulation, and attempted control is mostly wasted energy. We are not the masters of the external world. We cannot predict the future. Our best laid plans are always subject to catastrophic failure. There is no security to be found in the outside world. There is no secure job or relationship or situation of any kind. Everything changes. We can conceivably lose them all in the blink of an eye. 
Where then is true security to be found? Certainly not in the external world, but rather internally. Trust yourself to react appropriately when catastrophe happens. Failure of nerve is really failure to trust yourself. Alan Watts. This is the only true security, the security of trusting yourself, the security of flexibility and adaptability, the security of spiritual and emotional self-reliance. Rather than obsess over external events, we better serve ourselves by obsessing over inner resources. Our security and happiness come from our inner peace, our ability to accept any situation, adapt to it, use it, learn from it, and, perhaps, overcome it. The more we do this, the more confident we grow, and, in time, we develop a true sense of security in our lives, one that is completely independent of external circumstances. Practically, this implies that our task is to seek out new experiences and build our capacity to adapt to them. This is the reason I think of travel as a potentially spiritual practice. Travel, especially long, challenging journeys, expands our ability to accept and adapt to the unexpected and the unknown. This kind of travel is a concentrated training exercise in impermanence and change. Joseph Campbell, the famed mythologist, identified the common thread running through the mythological journeys found in most cultures. He noted that while these stories are always presented as external journeys, they are, in fact, symbolic of, inner, of the inner journey we must all make. In the end, we must all leave home, the safe and the comfortable. We must all face life-changing challenges. We must all face loss, and we must all arrive at our own understanding of impermanence and our own wisdom. This is the universal journey. Validation. I'm sitting at the table in my apartment, looking out the window. I turn back to the papers stacked in front of me. Interesting, I say. Very interesting. I glance over the test scores again, the pre-test numbers, the post-test numbers, and the amount each student improved. Good, good, I say, as I notice that all of the students improved over the course of the semester. All the post-test scores are higher than the pre-test scores. Most students improved by a couple of points, but my eyes are drawn to two sets of numbers, two names, Kyung and Jin. These two students improved dramatically more than all of the others. Their post-test scores show a big jump. What did they do differently, I ask myself. At the final class, I ask them, since all of the students had the same in-class experience, I focus on what they did outside of class. Most students followed traditional study methods. They studied textbooks. They used vocabulary books. They went to traditional English classes. But Kyung and Jin followed a different approach. In fact, they actually followed the method I continually harangued the class about. They focused on repeated listening and reading for fun. Both students said they took my advice seriously and therefore listened to English podcasts and audio articles one to two hours every day. Kyung joined the linguist and faithfully uses their system. Both students also read for fun, mostly easy materials such as National Geographic for kids, adolescent novels, etc. In TESOL, teaching English to speakers of other languages, jargon, these two exceptional students followed an input-based approach. The bulk of their study time was spent reading and listening to understandable and interesting English materials. Most students in schools follow an analysis-based approach. The bulk of their time is spent analyzing the language, breaking it apart, memorizing grammar rules, and doing drills. Plenty of research shows that input-based methods are faster and more effective than analysis-based methods. I knew this, which is why I always nag and conjole my students to focus on comprehensible input. But it was still thrilling to see this knowledge illustrated quantitatively 
in such dramatic fashion by my own students. The truly interesting part is that the pre and post test I gave them, the Michigan test, measures listening, vocabulary, and grammar. I'm not surprised that Kyung and Jin improved their listening skill, but that section was only 20% of the test. The remaining 80% tested both vocabulary and grammar. In other words, their vocabulary improved dramatically faster than the students who specifically studied vocabulary books and lists. Their grammar improved dramatically faster than the students who specifically studied grammar textbooks. This is not an isolated incident. Many research studies replicate these findings. See www.sdcrashin.com for the most thorough summary of these. In study after study, input-based approaches beat analysis-based approaches as measured by general English tests such as the TOEFL, TOEIC, or Michigan tests. These tests measure vocabulary, grammar, listening, and in some cases, speaking and writing. Though I'm aware of this research, I've never seen this phenomenon so starkly illustrated in person in a quantitative way, mostly because I've never had the opportunity to pre- and post-test my students. These results are a small but powerful validation of my own teaching approach and the methods I continually exhort my students to follow. I will now carry this plea to you. Do not analyze English. Do not use analysis-based methods. Do not rely on textbooks. Do not focus on grammar rules. Use an input-based method. Listen to understandable English. Listen repeatedly. Listen one hour every day and listen every day. And read. Read a lot. But don't read textbooks. Read easy materials that are fun and interesting to you. Many students, for some reason, don't follow my advice. But those who do, such as Kyung and Jin, improve much more quickly than those who don't. Follow this method and you too will improve faster, just like Kyung and Jin.